I, I would like to you. I'm sorry, Tongue, what did you say? Uh, I would like to you not because it's helpful to me. I can't hear you. You need to turn the volume up a little bit. I would like to not. You like the notes? Yes. Okay, good. Clear. Okay, good. Hi, Bree. Hi. Check the group chat. What I'm trying to figure out is if everybody's using the notes that I've been putting out. If you haven't, that's okay. All right, guys, I am going to go ahead and um, figure out dun, 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 how to share. We're going to start with, well, we're going to start with chapter 15 and we're going to end with chapter 15 today because can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Because this is a pretty long chapter. But the nice thing about this chapter is that a lot of it applies to each other, okay? So we are talking about the nervous system um, and disorders today. So what we're talking about basically is the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves, okay? Um, whereas the central nervous system is considered just the brain and the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system includes everything else. It includes our autonomic nervous system, our cranial nerves, our spinal nerves. So um, while the nervous system, when we think about it, we think about you know, how we feel with our hands, how we feel with our feet, we have to think of it in terms of everything, the brain, the spinal cord, and the nervous system. Okay, so the biggest common signs and symptoms, headache, nausea, vomiting, weakness, mood swings, fever. Now, obviously, a lot of these um, signs and symptoms can be for other diseases too, um, but they also are specific to the nervous system, okay? Some ones that are very specific to the nervous system are the stiffness in the neck the back or extremities, okay? The inability to move any part of your body. If there's a seizure or convulsion going on, any type of paralysis, any type of visual difficulties, okay? These are all symptoms that are specific to the central nervous system. So this goes beyond a normal headache. This is when, you know, you're, you can't move your neck without it just being in agony, that type of thing. Um, some more that are specific to the central nervous system, the inability to speak correctly. Um, again, I don't know why I put paralysis on there a second time. Um, extreme or prolonged drowsiness where you just can't shake the fog. And I'm not talking, you know, you, you, you're just going on a couple hours of sleep. It's just a, a, a mental, you just can't shake it out. Um, stupor where people... Um, just don't seem right, or you know they can't wake up. Um, amnesia or extreme forgetfulness. These are all problems that something is going wrong in our brain. Okay, so the first thing they will do is run some diagnostic tests if somebody presents with this. Okay, um, spinal fluid, a spinal tap. I always say if you have a headache and a stiff neck and a fever and you present to the emergency room, the first thing they're gonna do is a spinal tap because they're gonna to wanna to check for meningitis, okay? Um, but some other things they'll do is they can measure, measure intracranial pressure. They'll do x-rays of the skull and of the vertebral column. They'll do myelograms, angiograms, an EEG to determine what kind of electrical activity is going on in your brain. And they can CT scan and MRI your brain and your back um, for your vertebral column too, to find out if there's any blockages. So we're gonna get, break this down into a lot of different diseases um, and I don't wanna say conditions. So the first one we're gonna talk about are infectious diseases of this area, okay? So the first thing I wanna talk about is encephalitis, okay? Luckily it's not very common, okay? 
and it's an inflammation of the brain tissue. It's caused by either a bacteria or a virus. Okay. So again, we've got these symptoms, headache, elevated temperature, stiff neck and back, lethargy, mental confusion. Obviously coma is, you know, once it's progressed, but when you first present with a headache, an elevated temperature, a stiff back and neck, you know, it could be a number of things. Okay. But what they do then is they start doing cultures and they figure out, oh my gosh, there is a bacteria or there is a virus. Okay. So the treatment is supportive. Okay. So we're treating the fever. We are, are treating the symptoms that made the patient go into a coma. We're providing analgesics for the back, that the back and neck pain. Um, antivirals, we're using antibiotics if it's bacterial. Okay. Um, and one of the um, most common, I shouldn't say most common, but most concerning um, infectious diseases is meningitis. Okay. Um, and this is inflammation of the meninges or covering of the brain and the spinal cord. It can be bacterial, fungal, viral. It can be from a toxin, okay, from lead and arsenic, okay. Um, again, the symptoms are a high fever, severe headaches, um, sensitivity to light, stiffness and resistance in the neck, which is what they call neutral rigidity, um, drowsiness, stupor, seizures, coma. So, Again, they're going to do a lumbar puncture to, to check the spinal fluid, okay? Um, bacterial infection, bacterial meningitis is actually the preferred one because you can give antibiotics for it. Um, viral meningitis is a little bit more difficult, okay? Um, we can do, you know, treat the fever, treat the, the problems, try to keep them um, from convulsing and keep them in a dark environment. Okay. There is one more thing. There is um, a vaccine for meningitis out there. Um, anybody that goes to live on a college campus has to have it now, believe it or not. Polio or poliomyelitis. Okay. This um, is I would like to say an antiquated um, viral infection that causes um, the brain and spinal cord to just stop functioning. It causes paralysis. Um, it was a virus that used to be um, very prevalent. It was spread by either um, oropharyngeal secretions and infected feces. Um, again, it goes back to um, socioeconomic status where people didn't have um, indoor plumbing or their um, water was infected um, with wastewater, their drinking water and wastewater didn't have two separate sources. Um, we've almost eliminated it by the vaccine in the United States. One thing they are watching is they are hoping this um, doesn't make a comeback like whooping cough did when people stopped getting um, childhood vaccinations for their children. So again, polio, muscle weakness, neck, um, nausea, vomiting, those are all things that happen at the beginning. And then the muscles atrophy and become paralyzed. Okay. Now we can diagnose it much earlier before the muscles um, become atrophied and paralyzed. Um, they'll do a virus culture from throat, feces, and they can also do it from spinal fluid. So again, the supportive treatment for polio, um, if we get it early, they do um, bed rest and analgesics. Um, it used to be they would try to use braces to um, help the patient be supported while their muscles got reused. Um, a lot of physical therapy. Um, they used to need to do um, mechanical ventilation or iron lungs, um, which is kind of similar to our respirators now, um, but now they'll use a respirator if someone's having trouble breathing. But like I said, it is almost eradicated in the world today. Tetanus. Tetanus is also almost eradicated in the world today because we get tetanus shots, okay? Um, tetanus is a highly fatal infection of the nerve tissue. It's caused by um, Clostridium tetani, okay? Um, it used to be a lot more pro 
prominent because metal cans were used for a lot of things. Now we use um, plastic for um, things that used to, everything used to come in cans. When I was younger, applesauce didn't come in a can, come in a jar, it came in a can. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of other things. All vegetables came in cans. Um, nowadays, almost everything comes in disposable and recyclable plastic. Okay, spaghetti sauce used to come in a can when I was little. Um, and so since cans were used for so much more, um, if you got cut with the metal, that was one of the things they worried about um, how you would get tetanus. So nowadays, if you get cut, um, and you have to have stitches. That's one of the reasons why they ask you, have you had your tetanus shot within the last five years? Because they don't want you to get this fatal disease. Okay. Rabies. Thank goodness we don't see rabies too often either. Um, it becomes often, it becomes fatal um, because it infects um, the, my the myeloid part of our neural and spinal cord. Um, it's caused by a, vibrate, a virus. It primarily affects animals, okay? Dogs, cats, raccoons, and squirrels, okay? The only way we can get it as humans is through the transmission of an infected animal. Um, so if you see a raccoon during the daytime, they usually are nocturnal creatures. Try to stay away from it. Call the animal control place. Um, that's why if, some, if a dog... Um, that's why when dogs are licensed, they have to have rabies. That's one of the things to getting, um, having a dog licensed. So if um, a dog is picked up and it's not licensed um, and they can't prove that it had rabies vaccines and no one claims it, it will be put down because this is one of the things that they want to avoid putting back out into the general population. Um, Rabies is awful, okay? Um, the convulsions, people become enraged. Um, they'll have spasms. They alternate between spasms and paralysis of the muscles. Um, their throat spasms, and it just becomes awful. Um, the reason we see that drooly, frothy saliva is because they lose the ability to swallow, okay? Um, there are, if someone is exposed to rabies, there are anti-rabies injections. They are injections which go directly into your stomach. You have to have them for an extended period of time. Um, and there is no cure, but at least the anti-rabies injections will help you if you've had an acute exposure. Okay, now we're going to get into some infectious diseases that you know a little bit more about. Shingles. Um, Shingles is a viral disease caused by herpes zoster. It is a secondary um, caused by the chickenpox virus. Okay, so if you've had chickenpox or you got the chickenpox vaccine, okay, you can get shingles. It tends to only affect older people, um, the 50 plus population. Okay, it's pretty brutal. Um, it's an itchy, painful red rash. It follows nerve paths, okay? So I'm going to show you the next slide. Usually it starts, okay, in on, it always only spreads on one side of the body, okay? And in this person, it started on the front towards their stomach, and it spread through the lateral nerve path um, past their side. It sped, and it also spreads, uh, spreads, kind of towards the lymph pathway, as you can see, um, going towards the axilla area, and then it goes to the back. This is a pretty bad case of shingles. Um, and the reason it's so painful is because it is activating the nerve pathways. So it's pretty brutal. So I'm going to go back to the previous. Um, the symptoms last 10 days to several weeks, depending what's going on. Um, it is usually made based on the appearance of the lesions. Um, they can do a viral culture test. They can do a skin scraping to determine it, um, which is 
good because the sooner they get it, the sooner they, they can prescribe some things to cool off the nerves and they can prescribe some painkillers because let me tell you, from what I, I've seen with patients, it can be pretty brutal. It can get on your face, okay? So there ne is no treat, there is no cure, okay? And the treatment is purely to, to um, treat the symptoms. They can give antivirals, pain medicines, anti-fever medicines, um, antipyretics to keep them from getting infected, okay? Um, the vaccine is recommended by the CDC now for adults over 50. That switched last year. The book says age 60, but um, it was published before the CDC updated it. I will tell you, I have gotten the two vaccines for um, shingles, and they were two of the most brutal vaccines I have had in a long time. Oh, there goes the dog. Uh, Mom will get them. Um, the vaccines, they go in deep into your shoulder muscle. And I had shoulder pain for about four days, believe it or not. Okay. So now we're going to switch from infections to vascular disorders. Okay. So these are, are disorders which affect the flow of blood. Okay. So a CVA or a cerebrovascular accident is also known as a stroke, okay? It's due to poor blood supply to the brain and it can be caused by um, a clot or a thrombus, um, an air pocket or an embolus, okay? Or a hemorrhage, a bleed. Shh. And they came in to tell me what's going on. Um, the symptoms, they can be very numerous, okay, depending on the severity and the area of the brain being affected. Um, a sudden loss of con consciousness can occur, but that usually starts with confusion or poor coordination. Um, dysphagia and dysphagia, um, you know, so you're, you're having trouble speaking, um, it hurts to talk. Um, half of your face becomes paralyzed or half of your body becomes paralyzed. Okay, so the treatment is immediately they're going to provide an, high strength anticoagulant therapy. Okay, they're going to try to monitor the, the blood pressure, which is increasing during a stroke. And once they can get um, the cause under control and mitigate the cause, then they try to put um, patients into rehab. Okay. So they'll use a physical exam. They'll use an EEG to measure brain waves. They'll do a CT scan or an MRI. Um, but again, it's caused by either a hemorrhage, by a massive brain, brain bleed, by an air embolism, an air pocket or an embolism, or a clot in the brain. Okay. Um, of course, we know the risk factors for a CVA are basically the risk factors for everything bad in life. Um, a lot of times, if you can catch it early, um, the, the, carot the clot gets stuck in the carotid artery, okay? So they will go in um, by in the carotid artery in the neck and um, take that part of the artery out, and then they'll anastomose the other two ends together. Um, so a carotid end, art end arterectomy has saved many um, people from having bad strokes. So again, if you start to have any of those symptoms, they recommend you getting to the doctor immediately. And they can um, find the carotid clot with a simple ultrasound. If anybody has any questions, just tell me to stop. Because since I'm not talking to anything but the wall right now. I feel kind of strange, okay? Okay, a TIA is a transient ischemic attack. These are known as mini strokes, okay? They, again, are due to insufficient blood supply to the brain, okay? Um, it usually starts with some weakness and some dizziness, a little bit of slurred speech, maybe just somebody faints, okay? They can last for a few minutes to an hour, okay? But if somebody faints and they're a little dizzy, 
okay and it happens again and they're older it's time to get them looked at okay because little ones tias can often lead to big big strokes okay um they'll do an angiogram um, again they can do just some minor surgeries to improve blood flow which can really help with these um, okay so we're going from vascular disorders okay with strokes tia cvas okay now we're going to functional disorders okay this is there is something wrong with the physical parts of the CNS, okay? So treatment of these diseases is directed towards relief of the symptoms and improving functions for daily living, okay? So we're talking about a degenerative disc disease, a headache, an epilepsy, Bell's palsy, Parkinson. So these are problems with the actual physical um, CNS parts themselves. For example, the de a degenerative disc disease, okay? This is where, um, the inter intervertebral disc wear away and allows the vertebrae to rub or bump against each other and a lot of times the nerves get caught um, in this area too so people will have difficulty walking um, this is when they start to see oh hey why do i why does it hurt so bad going down the back of my leg um, that type of thing so it can be diagnosed via x-rays we can see um, it, it has to be a pretty uh, gross or large um, wearing away of the inter intervertebral disc um, to see it on an x-ray, but we can really pick it up on myelograms, CT scans, and MRIs. Um, the treatment is um, sometimes just to rest the backs and legs and let the area cool off, let the neural area um, give some antineurals. Um, to let the nerves cool off and then hopefully the pain gets better. Um, some people can be provided a back brace and that provides um, kind of like a man-made cushion for the vertebral column, okay? Anti-inflammatories, um, a lot of times if people have degenerative disc disease and it's flared up, they'll give them a course of oral steroids. Um, exercise, exercise can um, actually decrease the pain. Um, people can be given physical therapy exercises. And of course, the last possible thing they want to do is surgery. But sometimes surgery can provide a lot of relief to the pain for degenerative discs. Headaches, again, one of the most function human, one of the most common human disorders, okay? A headache is usually a symptom of another disease, okay, rather than just a disorder itself. Okay, and I have listed here a number of disorders that have headaches as a symptom, okay? But we all know that many other things can cause a simple headache, okay? But all a headache really is, okay, it's caused by one of two things, tension on facial neck and scalp muscles, okay? Or vascular changes in arterial sizes of vessels inside the head. Okay, when I say tension on facial, neck, and scalp muscles, it can be something as simple as wearing a hat that's too tight, or a hairband that is too tight, or a barrette, which is um, pushing on the scalp. It can be um, vascular changes in the arterial sizes of vessels in the head, so that's a little bit more severe. But again, um, when you're dehydrated, your blood vessels aren't as um, expanded as they need to be. So again, if you dehydrate, a headache is a big cause of it, okay? If you um, are in the sun too much, again, it's going to cause your ar arteries to contract. So some other contributing factors obviously are stress, toxic fumes, noise, lack of sleep, um, alcohol consumption, nothing that's any crazy or major. They can be acute or chronic, okay? The pain can be mild, unbearable, and incapacitating, okay? So when we talk with our patients, we want to make sure we ask them, you know, these things. Is it go on all the time, or is it just happen maybe one time a day? Um, you know, what's the pain scale? Is it constant? Is there a pressure? Is it throbbing, stabbing, intermittent? These will all help us diagnose which kind of headache it is um, and 
So it was or it's a tension headache, a cluster, um, a migraine. And anytime anyone has a lumbar puncture, there's usually a headache too because it's messing with the um, cerebrospinal fluid and the flow of that. So that anytime somebody has a spinal tap, we tell them you're going to probably get a headache. Again, um, mostly time we diagnose headaches usually just history. When they're a little bit more severe, we use our um, more intense and more expensive diagnostic tests. The first thing they're going to always tell you is to do your lifestyle changes. Okay, do some over-the-counter analgesics. Um, you know, then they're going to say, okay, then maybe we need to go to bed rest or massage or muscle relaxants. Um, sometimes a warm bath will help because it will really help to increase the circulation. Um, people that have really bad headaches, they are having great success with using biofeedback to help with triggers that cause the severe headaches. Epilepsy is another functional disorder. Um, it's, a, it's an abnormality with the electrical activity in the brain. Okay, So um, it usually starts, people don't even know they have it until they have their first seizure. Um, sometimes it's severe and the seizure can cause convulsions. There's three types, um, a petite mal, a grand mal, and a status epilepticus, okay? Uh, you don't need to go real crazy into those, but they're fun to know at least. Um, again, the diagnosis is using the history and blood tests and the scans, but we can't cure it, but we can treat it um, by uh, using anti-convulsive medication. The problems with these anti-convulsive medications is they require close monitoring and adjusting of medication. Most people get epilepsy when they're young, when they're children. Um, and so as children grow, we have to continually adjust the dose. Um, and, you know, um, it requires a lot of blood tests. So children who um, grow into adults of epilepsy have usually been through quite a bit. Um, it requires um, monitoring even as adults, especially once you go through the teenage hormone years um, and into adulthood. Um, once everything switches and changes every decade, they usually say you need some type of therapeutic adjustment, but they will do monitoring at least two or three times a year if you're an epileptic. Bell's palsy. We don't hear a lot about it. Um, but this is a disease which affects the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. Um, and it leads to one-sided paralysis on the face. Um, it commonly affects individuals age 20 to 60. The symptoms are um, a drooping or weakness in the eye and mouth, um, inability to close the affected eye. Um, people drool and they don't feel it, okay, which is a very odd thing. They can't whistle or smile, um, and they have a distorted facial appearance. So if they suspect um, Bell's palsy, palsy, they'll ask them to whistle, and um, it's they can't make the whistle um, face. It's, you know, not everybody can, not everybody can whistle, but everybody can at least make your lips in the form of you're going to whistle, or they'll ask you to smile. Um, and they'll usually notice one half of the face is not, not exactly right, okay? So they'll diagnose this basically using history and symptoms. Um, and the treatment is to um, try to cool that nerve off, okay? So they'll use analgesics and anti-inflammatories. Again, they'll start with um, usually a course of steroids to see if this cools the facial nerve off. Um, and it can re reoccur, okay? And the last of the functional or disorders that we're gonna talk about is Parkinson's, okay? Um, this is a slow progressive brain degeneration. We don't know why it happens, but we know that it's related to a decrease in dopamine, okay? The symptoms start gradually, okay? Um, they'll see rigidity and mobility of the hand. They'll see a very slow speech pattern kind of take over. People will, um, roll their fingers, and it's like you're rolling a little pill in the finger constantly. You'll see them doing that, okay? And um, 
often often they they have very expressionless faces. Um, they can't express joy. They can't express sorrow. Um, they just get a very platonic face. Um, they'll be bent forward. It's almost like their head's a little too heavy for them to hold up. Um, and this bent forward posture also makes their steps um, very short and quick. So they almost appear like they're shuffling, okay? Um, the symptomatic treatment is they do a lot with physical and psychological therapy for these people. And they also offer them dopamine replacement. And that has been a huge breakthrough in Parkinson's disease. People that used to um, deteriorate very rapidly with Parkinson's disease now live very long lives where people don't even know they have Parkinson's, which is very cool. All right, so we're switching from functional disorders now to the dementias, okay? And the dementias are, are a pretty big group, okay? It means any, any loss of mental ability due to the loss of neurons or brain cells, okay? And there's many types of dementia, okay? There's senile dementia, okay? Alzheimer's disease is a type of senile dementia, okay? But being senile is not synonymous with being having Alzheimer's. You can be senile but not have Alzheimer's, okay? Um, there can be vascular dementia, dementia caused by head trauma, or dementia caused by substances. And we're going to get into each of these, okay? I know this is a very long chapter, so if you need to you know, kind of just stretch and take a break. Um, we keep going, there's a lot in this chapter just because the brain is so important and the spinal cord. All right, so let's talk about Alzheimer's, okay? It's a form of senile dementia. Usually it affects people aged 60 and older, but there are things such as early onset Alzheimer's, okay? But it's not very common. And again, it starts with the short-term memory loss, the inability to concentrate slight changes in personality, okay? So these are all things we normally experience as we get a little bit older, okay? I know my memory, short-term memory isn't wasn't what it was, um, but I can still concentrate and I haven't had any personality changes, all right? So you'll see diminished communication skills. And by that, I mean, they'll have trouble finding the word that they want. Um, but again, just because somebody that can't figure out the word they'll say, oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Just because they can't figure out a word here and there doesn't mean they have dementia. It's usually a fairly regular thing, okay? They'll just, when they talk, they'll say meaningless words. Um, they won't be able to form sentences the way they used to. Again, an increased forgetfulness. But one of the biggest um, symptoms that diminishes Alzheimer's between just regular senility is they'll get really irritable and agitated. Um, we can only positively diagnose it using an autopsy, okay? And initially, the only way we figure it out is by rolling out a lot of brain disease, other brain diseases. Um, so the treatment, there is no known cure, okay? But there are drugs out there which are slowing down the progression of it, okay? Um, the focus is on keeping these patients safe, um, keeping their nutrition levels up, their hydration levels up, and their personal hygiene. Because what will happen if they don't have help is they won't remember if they took a bath today. And you can mark it on a calendar, but if they don't know what day it is and they forget what day it is, they're not going to get it, okay? Um, oh, did I forget to eat today? Or did I forget to drink enough today? Or their safety, they get lost very easily. Okay. And another thing is we have got to start providing better emotional support for family and caregivers um, of this group as our population starts to age. So we go from Alzheimer's, now we're going to vascular dementia. Okay. And again, when we're talking about vascular, we're talking about the blood flow. Okay. So we can have atrophy or cell death. Of brain cells because blood flow is decreasing, okay? This can be caused by atherosclerotic plaque, 
okay, which is causing a decreased blood flow. Okay, that's common with aging. Okay, so if um, you know there's a decreased blood flow to the brain because of plaque, we're going to see it's going to hopefully come up in scans. Okay, again, you're going to still see the changes in memory, personality, and judgment, the irritability. Okay sleeplessness, the lack of hygiene, okay, but they're going to do a blood flow test, and that's how they can determine this one is different than Alzheimer's, okay. Again, if they do find that it's due to decreased blood flow, they're going to um, figure out how to increase the flow to the brain, and if the, there is plaque in the carotid artery, again, some reason that carotid artery has a lot to do with this, um, they're going to clean it out. Okay, they're going to clean it out. So we can also have head trauma dementia, okay? And this is obviously death of brain cells due to a head trauma, okay? Um, we'll see this in um, car accident victims, in motorcycle victims, um, and we have seen this in domestic abuse, um, child abuse, okay? Um, there's a decrease in mental intellect and cognitive function. There's a loss of ability to reason, remember, or show appropriate emotions and changes in personality. Um, again, um, the head trauma can be from an accident. Um, it can be from somebody falling down the stairs and just any damage to the head, okay? Um, sports, that type of thing. So again, the, the, we want to correct the damage if possible. Um, if not, then we're going to go with therapy and rehab, okay? One of the big things is it's off, this one's very easy to prevent with the proper use of protective equipment. Um, so I'm gonna get on my soapbox for a minute. Make sure anytime you're operating a scooter, a skateboard, a bike, you wear a helmet. Anytime you're on a motorcycle, you wear a helmet. Anytime you're in a car, use your seatbelt. Okay, I'll get off my high, high mother horse now, okay? Then there's substance-induced dementia, and we're seeing an increase of this um, because it's brain cell death from drug toxicity and toxins. Um, of course, we're seeing it from the heroin and the cocaine, the increase to the street drugs. Um, we see it in alcoholics, okay? But we also see it in lead, from lead paint. We see it from um, people who want to um, have just regular um, household cleaners and chemicals that are around the house. Um, we see it in people that um, strip furniture that don't do it in a well ventilated area um, from paint fumes and paint thinners and varnishes and things like that. Um, it used to happen um, a lot more things used to have mercury in them. Mercury used to be in all kinds of thermometers, whether it was a, you know, a thermometer that you took your internal temperature or a thermometer where you determine what the temperature was outside. If they got broken, people were exposed to these things. Again, there was a, an incredible mental impairment and decreased cognitive ability. Um, but we, you know, this is one that can be prevented. It can be prevented using respirators when you're doing, um, using insecticides and paint fumes um, by not doing the drugs, by decreasing alcohol use, that type of thing. All right, so now we're out of the dementias and we're into sleep disorders, okay? These are pretty easy ones, um, ones we know a little bit more about. Insomnia, the most common form of sleep disorder. It's the inability to fall asleep or to stay asleep. Okay, um, it can probably the biggest thing it's caused from is stress. Okay, it can also be from pain, fear, depression, um, caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, and bronchodilators. Um, those are inhalers. So people who use their inhalers, they try to encourage you to use it earlier in the evening. Okay, so insomnia has lots of reasons. Um, the big thing that doctors try to help with is identifying and removing the cause. Sleep apnea is different than insomnia. Sleep apnea is characterized by periods of breathlessness or when you stop breathing, okay? Um, 
It can occur a couple times a night. It can occur a couple times every hour. It can occur more frequently, okay? Um, the causes, obviously, I have listed there. Um, probably the biggest one is obesity. Um, another one is airway obstruction. Um, sleep apnea, we, people are exhausted during the day. Um, their spouses will tell you that they are just incredible snorers. Um, they're going to see changes in personality, depression, impotence, and these are all symptoms of someone who's absolutely exhausted. Okay, so they can um, monitor affected individuals during sleep. Okay, they'll do a sleep study. They'll check um, your oxygen levels. They'll check what's going on in your brain function. They'll check what's going on in your mouth while you're doing that. And they'll do the treatment based on the cause. Um, they find that weight loss really does help. They can do surgery to correct nasal obstructions. They can provide oxygen. They can do medications to stimulate breathing. Um, they can use a CPAP, that type of thing. But again, most cases can be prevented prevented okay but not all of them all right we're gonna switch again there's a lot to cover during this one okay um the brain tumor two types primary and secondary a primary brain tumor is what it is a true brain tumor it is it grows and starts in the brain okay a secondary tumor is named after the organ of origin so Say I have a liver tumor that metastasizes to my brain, okay, it's still a liver tumor with brain metastasis. But then when we say brain metastasis, we know there's tumors in the brain, okay? Again, brain tumors, we don't know why, okay? The symptoms, <laughs> when you look at this list of symptoms, you can think, oh, well, Lord only knows what the patient has because they vary are very similar to some of the symptoms we just looked at in, you know, our vascular dementias or regular dementias um, for head, you know, anything really. So, but they'll obviously they're going to look at your clinical symptoms. They're going to do a good physical exam. They're going to do the scans. Um, treatment can involve surgery sometimes. Sometimes they are inoperable depending on where they are. So they will might be able to do radiation, they might be able to do chemotherapy, um, but usually it all depends um, where the tumor is located in the, in the cranial section. Okay, trauma, all right, well, you guys are doing great. I know there's a lot to cover in this one. Okay, we're gonna talk about the difference between a concussion and a contusion. Okay, a concussion is less serious than a contusion. Sorry. Um, a contusion is an actual physical bruising of the brain tissue. So, you know, when you smack your arm or your leg and you see that awful um, deep black or deep, deep blue or the green, um, the, terrible, the terrible bruising that occurs on your skin, that is what a contusion of the brain actually does. Okay, it's destroying the brain tissue. Again, um, it's usually due to a blow to a head by an object, a fall, or some type of other trauma. Um, many times this is preventable, which is very important. Um, the symptoms um, are um, a disruption of the normal activity. In other words, somebody goes unconscious, okay? And that unconscious period can last just a few seconds to several hours. Um, some people that are concussed never lose consciousness, okay? But the big first two things are the headache and the blurred vision. Then it usually, um, if it doesn't get better, it usually leads to a lot of irritability. Um, and um, a lot of times people, and they don't know why, but they'll draw their knees up to their chest and just start to vomit when a concussion happens, and we don't know why. So if they have a contusion, which is, again, more serious than a concussion, um, it can lead to a hematoma, okay? It can lead to increased intra intracranial pressure, and it can lead to 
permanent brain damage. So that's why when you hear someone has a, a brain bleed or a brain bruise, it's serious. Okay. So there's two types of trauma and I'm going to show you the next, the next picture. Okay. A coupe, a coupe lesion or a coupe bruise is in the front. It's when the front of the brain gets hit and a contra coupe is when the back of the head gets hit. Okay. Um, so you would see a coupe lesion if someone fell forward on their head. You would see a contra coupe lesion if their head snapped back or they landed on their head. Um, we will see contra coupe lesions a lot of times um, in car accidents because the safety, you know, the seatbelt keeps you, um, it protects your, your thorax, but you can also get that head snap back, that type of thing, okay? So they're going to obviously want to know history, okay? What's going on? Have you had a car accident? Have you had a sports injury? Have you had, you know, what's going on in your life? They're, they're going to try to ask you, have you slipped and fell? You know, have you fallen down the steps? And sometimes getting the cause of the concussion out of somebody can be a little difficult, especially if it's a domestic violence case or if maybe they're embarrassed or maybe they were dizzy. Um, a lot of our um, older population that live by themselves, they can have a fall um, and they don't want to tell anybody because they don't want to be taken out of their house. Okay. So if there is a concussion or a contusion, bed rest and direct observation are the first things you want to do. Now, it used to be if somebody had a concussion, you didn't let them fall asleep overnight, you checked them constantly. Now, um, they'll say you should check them every two to four hours. Um, just look at them, you know, you wake them up, you look at their pupil size, their mood and their behavior, that type of thing. You shouldn't give them pain relievers um, or any caffeine or any sedatives because that mask might mask um, the symptoms. And then if they do have to go to a doctor, um, it can interfere with the assessment. A skull fracture is an actual break in one of these skull bones, okay? The biggest dangers from this is the tiny little bony fragments can get in and damage brain tissue, okay? And those tiny little brain fragments can also cut um, vessels. They can cause bruises, okay? So anytime there's a skull fracture, okay, they're going to do usually MRIs and a lot of x-rays to determine if any bony fragments were broken off, okay. Um, the brain damage from a skull fracture may be temporary or it may be permanent. And that's one of the things after someone has a brain injury, that's why they say um, rest is so important because rest will help the temporary um, brain damage. It will help in a lot of things. It will allow a fracture to um, heal. It will allow a contusion to heal up, that type of thing. So again, with skull fractures, they're going to see a lot of different symptoms, okay? Um, a fracture near the base of the skull is going to interfere with breathing, okay? So just know that. Um, the, depend the treatment is dependent on the type and the position of the fracture, um, they may have to do a craniotomy, cutting into the bones to relieve um, intracranial pressure if there's swelling. Again, um, they may have to do protective headgear um, until the fracture is healed. Um, epidural and subdural hematomas. Okay, so these are bruises. We are talking about a big bruise. Okay, so an epidural hematoma is a collection of blood between the bony skull and the next layer inside as we're going into the head, okay, between the dura mater. So it's like between the hard bone and the first layer, okay, it's somewhere in the middle between the two of them. A subdural hematoma is between the dura mater and the arachnoid. So a subdermal the a subdural hematoma is between two soft layers. There's no bone involvement, okay? And subdural hematomas occur twice as often as epidurals, um, and I don't know why. So, an epidural hematoma. It's usually the result of a fight or an accident, okay? The blood vessels rupture and hemorrhage, or they seep blood usually pretty rapidly, 
okay? It occurs within a few hours, okay? Headache, dilated pupils, nausea, vomiting, okay? Usually the, as the hematoma grows, there's a loss of consciousness and there's an increase in the intracranial pressure, okay? So, you know, they'll try to get history out of people, but if somebody's been in a fight, they don't want to tell um, an accident, a car accident. Um, we see this um, in people who have single vehicle accidents who don't want to tell anybody. Um, and maybe they did, you know, hit their head or have um, a contra coup where they smack their head back, that type of thing. Okay. Um, a subdural hematoma is usually the result of hitting a head on a stationary object. Okay. And the best example I could come up with is when your head hits the floor. Okay. Um, again, it's usually, this one's usually over a period of days. It's not usually as serious as an epidural hematoma um, at the beginning. Okay. But it's over a period of days when the things get worse and worse and worse. Both of them are made by clinical history. And again, people don't always want to come clean if they've done something illegal, if they've done something stupid. So it's really important as the medical professional, you tell them, I don't care what it is. I just need to know. I'm not here to judge. I need to know so that I can fix you. Okay. Um, the first and most important thing is to make sure the intracranial pressure is decreased. Okay. Um, they can do this by putting burr holes in the skull. Um, they can do it by cauterizing the bleed if they can get if they can locate the the source of the bleed they can try to go in and cauterize it and close the source of the bleed up okay now we're going to talk about spinal cord injuries okay and this usually results when the bony spinal column is injured or fractured okay the cord can be injured anywhere okay from the base of the head all the way down to where you're sitting okay but the neck area is the most vulnerable okay automobile accidents are the leading cause of um, spinal cord injuries followed by gunshot and knife wounds and lastly falls and sports injuries um, the symptoms vary depending on the injury okay usually if there's the injury is to C1 through C3. These are the cervical vertebrae. It's usually fatal. This is a broken neck um, where the snap and the impact are so severe, it's just completely um, severed, okay? Um, other symptoms can be um, quadriplegia, okay? This is loss of movement and feeling in the trunk and all four extremities, okay? So basically they can usually only feel something from the neck up, okay? There's a loss of bowel, bladder, sexual function. If severe, um, they may need to be on a ventilator, but not all quadriplegics need to be on a ventilator, okay? Whereas a paraplegic, um, this is loss of movement and feeling in the trunk and both legs. Okay, so they may be able to use their arm. They may have partial feeling in their trunk, but usually from about mid trunk down, they've lost the function of the bowels, the bladder, and the sexual function. Again, history of injury, neurologic exam scans. Um, as far as immediate treatment, um, emergency treatment is absolutely necessary. Um, we try not to, if there's any type of spinal cord injury involved, um, we try not to move them until um, the EMTs and paramedics have arrived with the special collars and backboards. Um, but there are times you have to move them if the surroundings are unsafe, okay? Um, the treatment is going to be to realign and stabilize the spinal cord, decompress or release the pressure, um, to prevent further injury, there are times it can be healed, okay? We're going to get into our rare diseases, and we're on the home swing here, so hang in there with me. I know this is a long chapter. The first rare disease is known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It's 
amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, okay? And this is a destructive disease of the motor or movement neurons, okay? They just, be, they just get destroyed, okay? There's no treatment, uh, there's, excuse me, there's no cure. All we can do is do the supportive treatment. Um, and it's a lot better now than it used to be um, because what happens is the muscles will atrophy and it's progressive loss um, of the hands, arms, feet, and legs. Um, and so now we do a lot of physical therapy and a lot of occupational therapy and a lot of psychological therapy to keep people um, using um, the hands, feet, arms, legs, so that the less atrophy they, they're hoping, the less progression quickly of the disease. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is another one that's very rare, um, but it affects spinal nerves. Um, it, it happens 10 to 21 days after you've had a fever and they don't know what is happening. They just know that it's usually viral. Um, and it'll cause um, the spinal nerves to just become, um, how do I want to phrase this? Almost uh, super sensitive, okay? And, um, you know, we see this in a lot of people who have a viral um pneumonia and then when they're done all of a sudden they'll they'll start having some nerve problems in their spinal cords um but it goes away okay usually um it's complete but usually within 72 to 24 hours of this starting um you'll see partial anesthesia or partial partial facial weakness um you know, usually paralysis will occur, and sometimes they can progress for several days to weeks, the symptoms, but once the progression ceases, people will automatically recover. Um, they'll give supportive treatment. They'll usually give forms of physical therapy and occupational therapy and things like that. It is just, it, thank goodness it's so rare because it's so strange. Huntington's chorea, okay, this is an inherited disease, okay? It starts to appear during middle age, it's a progressive degenerative disease of the brain. It leads to mental deterioration. Um, it leads to loss of muscle control and chorea. And what chorea is, is it's abnormal movements. Usually the hands and the feet will start to jerk or twitch. Um, it causes changes in personality, mood, and behavior. Um, it, 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 it's very sad because it usually happens in 40 you know, like I said, it usually is in people who are 40 um, and they know they're getting it because usually they've seen a parent die from it, okay? There's no, no cure. We just have to do supportive treatment for it. So it, there's a genetic test for it. Multiple sclerosis, okay? What, this, what happens here is the central nervous system nerves become demyelinated, okay? And so information leaks from the nerve pathways, which means... Um, there's poor nerve transmission in both directions. Um, it, leads, it leads to complete muscle weakness, complete lack of coordination, again, paresthesia, um, speech difficulty, loss of bladder function, visual disturbances, especially diplopia, or double, double vision, okay? Um, but the nice, I won't say the nice thing, but the good thing is we have some things that we can fight multiple sclerosis with now, okay? Um, it usually affects adults onset is usually between the ages of 20 and 40 and they'll have good periods and they'll have bad periods. Um, one of the biggest thing is we will use physical therapy, um, muscle relaxants when there's, um, spastic movement. And another thing with, um, people with multiple sclerosis, um, they're finding that, um, medical marijuana has also been very useful in um, treating a lot of the symptoms. Last but not least, our effects of aging. Okay, when we get old, okay, we already have an automatic decrease in our nervous system activity, okay? Everybody has um, short-term memory. Everybody, you know, 
eyes get a little worse. You guys have seen me. I don't do much without my reading glasses. Okay, peripheral vision. And when you get older, you also have altered sleep patterns um, because you're sedentary um, a little bit more. Um, it can cause a lot more muscle cramping, which can affect your sleep. Um, you get tired during the day. So you take a nap. And when you take that nap every day, it may alter your sleep pattern at night. Um, but, you know, just because you're losing your memory a little bit doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's disease. That's um, a big thing that people will come in to the primary care doctor for. And they're absolutely terrified because they're, they're losing their memory. Okay. Um, usually um, every time um, uh, an older patient comes in, they'll do a series of questions. Um, they usually ask the year, who's the president. Um, they'll ask them their name, their birth date. They'll ask them a series of how many, you know, kids do you have? Questions that they already know the answer to. Um, and, you know, most people can come up with the answers. If they start to suspect that there might be a little bit more going on, they'll go into a little bit more in-depth questionnaire. But um, the primary care physicians are the, our frontline people for um, memory issues. And obviously, uh, many of the things we talked about today can be avoided by using um, the proper equipment when playing sports. Again, wearing your seatbelt, um, wearing a, a, a helmet when using a motorcycle. So do you guys have any questions for me? I know we covered a ton of information today. Uh, my only question is, um, when is our next test? When is your next test? Hold on, let me look. Did I not put that on the... Um, I haven't looked, so don't quote me that it's not on there. All right, hold on. Let me put my computer down and go over to my desk. You're going to get a good look at my office. Hold tight. Okay. Oh, hold on. I was trapped by all the cords. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. This, this is week 10. Okay. So quiz five, which is on 13, 14, and 15, which is this. Okay. It opens on four five. Okay. Which was, I believe, Sunday, this past Sunday. It's due on four nineteen. Okay. okay. Um and uh the the um drop box when is that due for this chapter? Not till next week, right? Yep, it's due on 412. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I and tried to look for the quiz on there and I didn't see it. Like it, I don't think it was posted yet. Oh, well, maybe I didn't activate it yet. I will have to go look. <laughs> Give me a day to look at that. Um so you guys all remember we don't have a final exam um, test in this class, but I have you doing a paper, okay? Do not freak out about the paper, okay? I'm not going to require it to be in APA form. I am not going to require perfection, okay? Um, is anybody stressing out about it? No. No. Good. Because I don't want you to. Um, I don't expect the world's greatest paper written. Um, what I expect is a lot of effort. Um, and we'll go over it probably next week. Um, but um, I don't do a cumulative exam because this class is like taking a medical school class. <laughs> and if I did a cumulative exam, it would be you know, how can you give 100 points on all of this activity? So what I'm looking for in the final exam is for you to use different things that you've learned throughout this course and tie them into. I give you a couple different topics to pick from. So, all right, well, I will work on getting that quiz active. I'm sorry about that. Um, you should have told me about that. But other than that, 
everybody have a great week and continue to stay safe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Thank you. Bye, everybody.